uh, to this session of the jug, and I will give the voice to Mikael. This one, or this one? I don't know. Zoom is always wrong. In fact, I'm pointing someone. It's probably not the right one. Mikael Isvi uh, for the introduction for the session for today. Thank you. Mikael? Um. Yes, I'm afraid I have. Ah, it's uh, okay, I'm going to do uh, to introduce uh, Sergey, but without slides. Sorry, I have a bit of technical issue, uh, but that's fine. I don't have so much to say. So, welcome everyone. We're super happy to have you tonight. Uh, so, we are the Singapore uh, Java User Group, and we are like uh, basically like we've been active for like three, four years already. Uh, since the COVID-19 situation, we started doing virtual events. So now we do like one event every like two to three weeks. And uh, last time we felt like it was maybe a bit too quiet. That's why we asked Jerome if he could be our facilitator. So big thanks to Jerome Bourgeon for being our facilitator tonight. And uh, yeah, and so tonight we have like a very special guest. We have Sergi Almar, who's a longtime friend and he has been in the Spring community since 2005. So by the time, probably most of you guys are not old enough for that, but it was like Spring 1.2. And uh, there was just like a bunch of people using Spring and Sergi was one of the first people to travel the world to teach people about Spring and to enable them to speak at conferences, all that kind of stuff. And he's so passionate about Spring that he actually created the European Conference about Spring, which happens every year in Barcelona. It's actually huge. It's like 1,000 people. Uh, all the, the Spring engineers, all the committers actually come to Barcelona to speak about Spring for like two or three days. And it's super awesome. So Sergi has been doing it for 10 years. Of course, not this year because we don't have conferences this year, but he will be, or maybe we'll be back like in, uh, in October. And Sergi like, came many times to Singapore and he spoke to Vox Day Singapore twice as well. So yeah, Sanjay, let's go. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael. It's a pity that I can't be in Singapore this time, but uh, well, we got a, an alternative at least. So let me just uh, share my screen here. Um, okay. All right, so again, thank you very much for having me at the uh, Singapore Java User Group. I've been uh, with you some other days in person, uh, both in the Java User Group and uh, at the Vox Days as well, which uh, is amazing. I really enjoy being in Singapore. But well, today we're going to uh, be doing it from Barcelona, which is where I am. Actually, my background picture is uh, Barcelona. And that's basically where I run the Spring IO conference, somewhere uh, like here. Right, so that's basically the venue of the Spring IO uh, conference. Right, so thank you for, for joining. And uh, well, my name is uh, Sergi, and we have a lot of flavors of uh, my name. And I guess that you have heard uh, uh, things like Sergey or I don't know, uh, Serge, uh, many other pronunciation of, pronunciation of my names, depending on the language that uh, you're using. But uh, my uh, name comes from Catalan. So I live in Barcelona, where we speak uh, Spanish and Catalan. And this is the, uh, the Catalan version of, of the name. And I guess that uh, the ones that, got, that get my name uh, better are the Indians. I'm not sure how many people from India we have today, but I guess that we have a, a bunch of people from India. But uh, when I went to, to India first time, usually people call sir to someone who uh, they don't know, right? So they say sir and they say something. But if you really want to be formal, they usually say sir G, right? So G is basically the formal uh, version of, of sir, right? So when I first uh, went to India, I was hearing sir G, so my name at all the time. And uh, I didn't realize that this was an Indian name. I was like, oh, this cannot be an Indian name, right? But so apparently they were basically addressing to someone right in a formal way. So that's uh, usually uh, where I get my, my name best uh, pronounced. So a couple of uh, words uh, on me. Well, so I'm basically a Java and uh, Spring software engineer where I spend half of my time with clients uh, doing some development and half of my time during doing some trainings right, for Spring and also for Kafka. And I, as Michael said, 
I'm also the uh, Spring IO conference organizer, which is the uh, conference in Europe for Spring. So if you're if you're into Spring, you should definitely check that out. We had a virtual event this year, right? Um, the in-person event is scheduled for October. We'll see what happens. But uh, if you have any chance in any any year to come to Barcelona, Spring IO is uh, the place to be. But today. I'm here to tell you a little bit about containers, right? And uh, well, because uh, probably you are a uh, Java developer, uh, probably using a Spring as, or a Spring Boot as well, and you're used to package your applications as jar files or WAR files. And when we package the application as a jar file, we probably uh, send this application to the DevOps team, which uh, well, they, they basically run. So they have to gather the dependencies. They might have their, gather things like a, a, a GRE, right, or maybe a separate container, or also probably they pass some parameters to your application. And that leads to the works of my machine kind of thing, right? Because, well, the application works in your machine, but probably in another environment, you don't have the required dependencies or you're running in a completely different environment. And that's not ideal, right? So what we want is to run the uh, application in a, an environment which is really close to what we have in in development, right? So development and production should be quite similar. And that's why probably a container might be a good idea because in a container, we have everything we need to run our application. That includes the OS uh, file system, the application file system, things like how to run the application, the parameters that we have to pass to the application. So we can take this container and run it anywhere, right? In the same uh, way. So you can just build the container yourself and send it to the DevOps team and they will just need to run this container. But that, mean, that means that you now need to create this container. And well, creating a container might seem a really easy thing, right? But you'll see that you'll have a lot of power when you create this container. The easiest way to create a container is by creating a Docker file. And so that's basically the easiest way to get started. And well, uh, you might say, well, I have uh, this uh, couple of lines here uh, in our Docker file, and this get, gets me a container, right? And so that will create a container. But is this container the most optimal, optimal container for you and for your application? So if we take a look at this uh, Docker file, so what we do is to basically take a base image coming from Adopt of OpenJDK, and uh, as the name implies, this will kind of give us a GRE right on, on Java 11. And then we just take the jar file from our Spring Boot application, which is copied in, inside the container, and we define how to execute that uh, application, the Java Mini Jar and the application. Well, now you have a container, so we could stop here at right, uh, our presentation. You have everything you need inside a container. But things are not as easy as we have seen. Actually, in that Docker file, you can do whatever you want. You can uh, copy stuff, you can download things, you can do whatever you want. You have a lot of power. But we know that with a lot of power uh, comes a lot of responsibility. So you have to be responsible for a lot of things. For instance, uh, well, the first thing that could come into your mind is which base image we should use. And the base image implies a bunch of things. Right? So it implies the operating system that you'll be running on. It also implies the uh, job distribution, whether you want to also uh, use a JK or a GRE, the Java version as well. Do right? you want to run on Java 8, Java 11, Java 14? Right? So this is basically the first question that comes into your mind. So we take a look at the um, container that the previous Docker file will create, and we inspect it by calling Docker history. Right? So that will basically tell you a little bit about the layers inside the container, because a container has a bunch of layers. So you'll have uh, the layers from the base image. Usually these are read-only layers. And as we, uh, as we see here in our Docker history, the first layers are going to belong to Ubuntu Bionic, right? So which is uh, 18.04. Uh, so this is basically the operating system layers. So it's basically contributing some uh, of the operating system layers. On top of that, we have the layers contributed by the uh, GRE hotspot. So that will basically provide the GRE to your container. And after that, you will see that your layers will be added on top of those base images or on, on top of these this base layers. So if we take a look at the Docker file that we have created, every single line will transform in a single layer. So notice that, well, we have the from that basically contributes the GRE, but then the args, 
uh, target jar is actually its own uh, layer. The copy is another layer, and the entry point is another layer. So let's take a look at the copy one. Right? So you'll see here that we have copied the entire jar. Right? So that's actually 18 max. And in Docker, you can actually reuse layers which are, which are below you. That means that if you change anything in your application with that particular Docker file, you'll have to rebuild the jar file and recreate the container and replace the whole layer. Right? So you'll have to change the entire layer because your application is a single, a single deployment unit. It's a jar file. This might not be ideal because probably most of the mechs here in this jar file are going to be li libraries. So things that you'll be use, using which don't change. So you'll be changing your code, but you won't change the spring version, for instance. So we can do better by layering a little bit more this Docker container. And if we layer the Docker container a little bit more, what we'll achieve is basically faster builds because we don't have to copy right, the uh, entire application anymore. And also when you uh, deploy this or you push the application into a container registry, you'll only have to push the layers that have changed. If those layers are smaller, this are, is going to be much faster. So in terms of bandwidth, we're going to save a lot of it. So I'm going to introduce some of the features uh, in Spring Boot to the three. And in Spring Boot, uh, we have a Maven and a Gradle plugin, which basically creates the artifact, right? So here we have on the left-hand side, the Spring Boot Maven plugin, which allows you to create a jar file or a WAR file. So basically creates this Uber jar. But now in Spring Boot to the three, what we can do is to enable a layered jar, right? So we are going to pass these layers enabled equals true uh, parameter and this will create an index for the layers that we have in our application. So if we take a look at the content of the jar file, now that we use a, a layer jar, you'll see a file under boot uh, hyphen inf layers idx, that, that's the index. And this will tell you the layers that you will find in our jar. Right? So we have a layer for the dependencies, we have a layer for the loader, we have a layer for the snapshot dependencies, and we have a layer for the application itself. So now we have layered our jar. When we have a, our jar layered, what we can do is to basically copy these different layers in its zone, um, or the different parts of the application in its zone layer. And here, here's a more advanced uh, Docker file where we use a multi-built right, or multi-step uh, Docker file. So the first part is basically uh, getting a base image from uh, the adopt open JDK, so 11 GRE hotspot. And this is only to extract the layers from our jar. So basically we're going to explode the jar and extract the layers. So this first part of the Docker file serves just as the builder. So we're going to just um, uh, forget about this, uh, this um, part of the Docker file, this base image and our container will be um, created from this other base image where we also right, extend from the base uh, 11 GRB hotspot uh, base image, and we're copying some of the files from the builder, which is what we have created previously. So we basically extracted the layers, and we're copying those layers in its own, um, or those parts of the application in its own layer in our container. And then we're basically changing the entry point to use the jar launcher, which might be uh, better than using Java minus jar. So that's basically what you could do right, in Spring Boot to the 3. But if you're not in Spring Boot to the 3, you can still use it. You'll have to basically uh, split your application, copy the, app the different parts of the application into different layers, and you'll end up in a much better uh, Docker file. So now if you change just one part of the application, you won't have to push right, all the layers to the remote repository or to build the container, you'll just have to uh, take care of the layer that has changed. But you have to take care of more than this. By default, when you create a container, you'll be running as a root user, right? And we know that uh, running things as a, good, uh, as a root user is not ideal. So you should take care of that as well inside your container. Containers are not, not VMs, so they are not security, security boundaries. So you should run as a non-user and as a non-root user. You have to understand how the build cache works. 
you have to also understand how the multi-stage build works, like we have seen before. You also have to be aware of tax. You have to also be aware of memory allocation. How much memory do you need in your container? And many other things. So you can find some of the best practices on docker.com. So if you go to docker.com, uh, we have a, an article on uh, some of the best practices that will tell you how to build a, um, a Docker file right, in a, a proper way. If you go to uh, Google Cloud, they will also have their own best practices. So as you see, we have to take care of a lot of things inside this Docker file. So creating a, an efficient Docker file is not trivial. Right? So you'll have to take care of the base image, you'll have to take care of a, a multi-stage build, the user, uh, maybe you want to trim down the GRE, maybe, well, you have to do a lot of stuff. But, well, we are Java developers, right? And uh, for instance, for myself, I don't want to spend time on creating those containers, on creating um, Docker files with the best practices. Is there any way we can get those containers created but having the best, practice, best practices that we have seen? Well, one option you have is JEEP. So JEEP allows you to create a, um, a container without any Docker file. So you have here the URL container, um, Google Container Tools JEEP. This is basically a, a tool that well, uh, has a Maven and a Gradle uh, plugin. You can add it into your Spring Boot application and it cre will create the container for you. It will use the distroless uh, base image by default. You can change that, right? but this will basically be the base image. And it will also split the application into multiple layers, at least right? uh, layers for the application, for the dependency, and for the resources. It will also push the, uh, the image into a remote registry or into a container registry. Right? So usually the way we expose this container is by pushing that into a registry. This could be Docker Hub, this could be a local registry, this could be uh, 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 the registry from, from Google, from uh, AWS, uh, so any kind of registry. Right? And the interesting thing about Jeep is that it can create the, uh, the, the Docker container without a Docker daemon, which makes it really a good fit for CI CD's kind of environments where you, cannot, where, where you don't have a Docker daemon in place. And the version 2.4 just came out last day, right? And uh, it has also an extension framework. So if you see that Jeep is not enough and you want to provide some extra behavior, right? You can use the extension, extension framework to extend it right, with your own needs. So this is actually one option to use Jeep for the container. So you'll get a well-defined uh, container with the best practices and so on, right? Another option would be a build packs. And if you have used um, Cloud Foundry back in the days or uh, Heroku, maybe the name Billpacks right, uh, is already familiar to you, right? But in uh, 2018, right, uh, the Cloud Native Billpacks right, were created. So that was a, an initiative, right, to standardize kind of the way we created those uh, containers. And you can find the spec on billpacks.io. So if you go to billpacks.io, you'll see that billpacks.io is just a spec. Right? So it doesn't have any implementation on uh, the specs that it defines. But the main goal is to end up having an OCI container out of no Docker file. So basically with zero configuration, we want to get uh, an OCI image. And we have multiple implementations uh, of, uh, of uh, the spec. We have uh, implementations coming from Her Google, from Heroku, from Cloud Foundry. We have also uh, an implementation uh, called uh, Paketo, which is what we're going to use uh, today. Right? But uh, of course, every platform has its uh, own needs. So that's why we have different implementations of uh, the, um, the build pack spe specification. Right? But the main goal here is to basically have uh, or end up having containers which are uh, fast to build, right? so which have uh, reusable layers, and also that are reproducible. So if you recreate the same image multiple times, you should end up having the same container. Right? So the same input will uh, lead to the same output. So we, get, we want to be kind of uh, deterministic here. So we take a look at the Paketo build packs. So this is basically what we're going to use today. So that's one of the uh, implementations provided by the um, Cloud Native, uh, sorry, the uh, Cloud Foundry team, right? Back in the days, so Cloud Foundry, we had uh, a bunch of build packs, right? So now uh, we are basically taking those build packs to outside the platform so you can use them on your uh, 
maybe local development machines or anywhere else to build your containers. So Paketo will have a bunch of uh, build packs. If you take a look at the Java build packs, you'll see that we have build packs that will do a lot of things for you. For instance, if you want to use Tomcat, uh, this build pack will contribute Tomcat to you. If you want to use Spring Boot, this will do something for you as well. Um, for instance, if you want to use a GRE, you can use the, the, the Liberica build pack, for instance, to get a GRE in your um, container. So we have a bunch of build packs available here and we'll see how they work within our end of arm. So let's uh, do a quick demo on how to build our containers. And I have a really simple application here. It's, um, it's not relevant for the purpose of the demo, but this is just a Spring Boot application. It's using the latest version of, uh, of a Spring Boot to the 3.1, and it's basically a, a exposing a REST controller that says hi right, uh, from, from an endpoint. So let's uh, start and create uh, a container out of it. So I have created a Docker file. Let me just uh, quickly get into that. This is the Docker file that we have seen in the slides. So we can actually create a Docker, a Docker container out of this Docker file. That's uh, what we're going to see uh, first. Right? Uh, so we're going to um, first uh, package the application. So this will create my jar file, the jar file that we need to uh, build this container because the Docker file is not compiling my application. We could do that, right? but it's not doing it. So I'll have to create the jar file first, and then I'm going to create the container. So it's, it's basically compiling, passing the test, lovely, and hopefully in the target directory we'll have our jar file, which is uh, this one here. So now we can build a, um, a Docker container. So we can pass that, uh, sorry. We can define a tag, uh, let's call it, um, I don't know, Spring uh, Boot SG. And we should go to the previous directory. So I think that this is it. So, okay. So hopefully this will get the Docker file from the previous directory because that's where we had the Docker file. And it will start creating the Docker file. Great. So now if I do Docker images and uh, grab some more, actually the one that we have created is this one here. And we could inspect it, it's uh, Terry. And we'll see that, uh, well, we have uh, what we have seen. And so we are going to see that the uh, different commands in our Docker file will translate into those layers. So now we can just uh, run it, minus P, 8080, and we take the image itself, uh, which is uh, this one here. And this should run our Docker container, start running. So we go to localhost 8080. Let's see if it's running. Maybe I, oops, I just for, have a typo here. I didn't export the port correctly. That would be the easiest way to get a container, right? a Spring Boot container. All right, so we have here, hi from Docker Singapore. That's great. So now what we have to do is to uh, push that into a container. Right? So I have here um, a local uh, Kubernetes cluster and also a local registry. I'm using Kind for that. Right? So Kind allows you to create a Kubernetes cluster out of uh, Docker containers, so you don't need much. Uh, and this is great to uh, run locally and start your Kubernetes cluster uh, locally. But now we'll have to uh, push right, this application into the registry. So I'm going to uh, curl the registry for a second. So we have actually a bunch of uh, uh, repositories already in, in the registry, but the way to uh, push the the image to the registry is basically doing Docker push, right? And then pushing that into the registry. Right? So I'm going to skip that. Right? So as we have a bunch of uh, images already in the repository, I'm going to uh, move into the next uh, step, which is uh, basically taking a look at the layers. So we take a look at the jar file that has been created. Uh, let me see that. So what we can do is to basically inspect the layers that we have in here. 
So we have here a list command that will tell you the different layers that we have in the chart files. As we see here, we have a, a bunch of layers which, is, which are created by Spring Boot. So remember that when you use the Maven plugin with uh, layers enabled, this will create an index file that will create the layers for you. So by using the list command, you can see the different layers that your application has. You can, of course, create new layers if you want. And if you use extract, you'll be able to extract those, um, those layers. And in this uh, Docker file, which is the one that we have seen in the slides, I'm basically using the extract uh, command to extract all these layers and then build the different layers right in our container. But again, enough of Docker files because as we, we are Java developers who well, maybe you're not interested in uh, building the, the Docker file yourself. So I'm going to uh, use JIT now in order to create the Docker file. So I'm going to do a Maven compile. And I'm going to use the JIT docker build uh, command. So if we take a look at the POM file, I have added uh, JIT into it. So let's scroll down. So I have the JIT plugin, which uh, will create a the uh, container for me, and I'm, it's going to push it directly to my local registry. So localhost 500, 5000 slash Spring Boot SGJIP is, is going to be my container name, right? So this will push into my local registry just by using JIP Docker build. So let's try to create a Docker file uh, with no, uh, sorry, a, a Docker container with no Docker file. As we see here, uh, we are using uh, the Maven plugin for, for Docker. So notice that we're using the distro-less base image as we don't have any, um, any um, Docker file. So Jeep will choose the base image for us, right? So you can change that, but this is already chosen for, for us. And it's also splitting the application into multiple uh, layers. So now what we can do is to take a look at the uh, built uh, container. So this is basically the built container. And uh, a really nice tool to uh, dive into the container and see the different layers that, layers that we have in our container is dive. So you can do dive and the name of the container. And this will uh, give you like a pre-visualization of what's inside the container, which is really, really nice. So on the right-hand side, as we see here, we have the different images or different layers of our image. So um, we're going to focus on the three last layers. So these three last layers are nothing more than our application. Notice that this layer that I have selected is contributing, is adding the libraries of our application. So on the right-hand side, you can see this in red. So it's basically adding these libraries, which are uh, 18 megabytes. So this is usually what will never change in your application. You'll probably change your code, but maybe you won't be changing your libraries. So that's why this is in a lower layer than your application code. But if you take a look at the second uh, layer, which are some, some bytes, uh, these are just the resources. So for instance, the application the properties that you have in your application. So it's contributing this part of the image, which are the resources. And the last layer is contributing your code. Right? So these are the application classes here. Right? So this is the code that you have. Great. So we have classes, libraries, and resources in different layers. So let's do one thing now. Let's go back to our application and let's change something. Right? So let's change um, our uh, class and let's say, well, I want to show hi from Docker Singapore Jeep. And I'm going to uh, build the application again. That's right? so I'm going to use Maven compile uh, Jeep Docker. So I'm going to compile it again. And hopefully this will reuse my existing layers because we don't have to change anything. We just need to uh, change the layer for our application. And this will create yet another container. Well, let's compare these two containers now. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Hopefully this will fit in one slide. No, okay, great. All right, so let's dive into the new container. And we'll compare the hashes of every single layer, right? So every single layer has a hash, so we know whether we can use it or not. And let's take a look at the three layers that we have seen. And now we're going to take a look at this hash here. This is the hash of the container or of the layer. So let's compare that with the other uh, container. So we take a look at the hash of that layer. We see that it's the same 
right, in both containers. Both containers have the same layer. That means that this has been cached and they both use the same layers. But it's actually great because these are the dependencies. These haven't changed. So we could reuse that layer from the cache. What about the resources? Let's take a look at the resources. The resources has this hash down here. So let's take a look at the hash from the second container, the new container, and we see that they are both the same. So we have reused the resources as well. But what about the last layer, which is our application? So our application has changed. So we take a look at the hashes from both uh, containers, we see that they are now not the same. So this hash uh, starts with 29.8, this other hash starts with FDF. So the container just differs uh, on the last layer, the, um, the topmost layer. And notice that it's only 3.5 kilobytes. That means that if you want to push that into the registry, which we have done with Chief, we have just pushed these 3.5 kilobytes. We haven't pushed the entire image, which is great, right? Because this leads to faster builds, this leads to less bandwidth. So when you're developing, this is really important, right? So that's basically what we achieve by layering the container. Lovely, that was a JIT, right? Uh, and basically we compared the different digests or different uh, hashes from the containers. So the other alternative that we have seen is, was basically the build packs. And uh, in Spring Boot 2.3, we have really nice integration with, uh, with build packs. And by default, we're going to use the Paquero build packs. So how can we create a, build, uh, a container right, from the build packs? So we have a command, uh, which is, uh, well, Maven Spring Boot build image. Uh, you can define your image name, right, which will be a local host 500, 5000 Spring Boot SG. And when I do that, we're going to use build packs to create the container. Let's see what happens when we create those, uh, uh, those containers. Well, the first thing that will happen is, of course, building the application, compiling it, passing your tests. So that's a normal uh, Maven build, right? But after that, when everything is uh, generated, we have our jar file. So notice that we have here um, our jar file. We're going to start creating the build pack in, in um, sorry, the, the container. In, um, in build packs, right, that we don't have the concept of a base image, we have the concept of a builder. Right? So you'll see that we'll be using a builder, which is by default a base platform API 0.3, and it comes from the Paquero build packs. When you create the container, uh, more than one build pack can um, interact or actually participate in that, that creation of the build pack. In our case, we see that we have five build packs that will be participating when creating this particular uh, container out of 15. Right? So we're basically creating what's called a build plan and the build plan will define which, uh, which um, um, build packs are going to participate in the creation of the container. So we see that we have something called uh, Bellsoft Liberica. This is basically a GRE or well, a job distribution. We have another build pack that will take care of the executable jar, Apache Tomcat, uh, this is it, and a Spring Boot. Great. So, well, uh, seems that I have run this uh, before already, so I probably will get a bunch of layers from, from the cache. But let's take a look at the different uh, build packs. The first build pack that kicks in is the Paquero Bellsoft Liberica build pack. Notice that this will uh, contribute, in our case, a GRE. And it will contribute a GRE, which will be a GRE 11. Right? So depending on what you expect, this could contribute a, a JDK or a GRE, of course, having a JDK in production or in a container might not be a good idea, right? So apart from being, or the container being bigger in size, this is not a good idea, right, in, uh, in a container. So probably you'll need a GRE to run your application, but along with the GRE, it will start contributing a lot of uh, layers. For instance, the memory calculator. Memory calculator is quite interesting because it will calculate the amount of memory that your container uh, ha or requires, right, based on a bunch of things like the number of threads, number of classes that you have. So when you start the container, the first thing that you will see is the memory calculator kicking in. We have another layer, another uh, um, layer contributed, which will be the class counter. Uh, we have another layer, which is the JVM kill, because when you run out of memory, your uh, process might, uh, might be in, a, in an inconsistent state. So the JVM kill will be an agent that will take care of uh, killing your, your process. So it can be recreated by Kubernetes, uh, for instance. We have the local DNS, so that's basically 
uh, uh, local DNS because, well, uh, the uh, JVM, when it resolves uh, an address, it caches that address uh, forever, right? So this will basically uh, uh, have a local DNS so you can um, uh, interact with resources that have or change the IP frequently, like in, in Kubernetes, right? Uh, where we have different pods, different resources that change the IP frequently, and you don't want to cache those resources. We have also uh, job security properties and uh, basically certificates. So you'll see that uh, we have a bunch of layers added to the container that will give you a lot for free, right? So if we compare that to the first Docker file that we have created, that Docker file didn't have anything. So it lacked a lot of things. Right? And another thing that uh, the build packs will do is to create a, a user. So you'll be running your container on another user, which is not the root user. So we have a, a, a GRE. So now we have this exec executable jar build pack that will add the, um, the, um, the, the entry point, right? So that's basically how we're going to execute uh, the jar file. We have other uh, build packs that will contribute also for instance, the Spring Boot build pack and many other build packs, and notice that all of them will basically contribute in different layers in our container, right? So we're gonna see that in a second. And eventually, we'll get our image uh, created, which is this one here. So let's take a look at, um, at the image that we have uh, created with Dive. Right? So as mentioned, Dive is a really nice tool to inspect the, the image. And so we're gonna use Dive and we'll see the different images that we have different layers that we have in our uh, container. Great. Um, so I'm going to jump directly into uh, some of these layers. Let me just uh, change the filters here and uh, just uh, filters, and I don't want the unmodified. Okay. Now, um, so let's take a look at the, this, uh, this one here, right? So this is basically the layer where we see that the build pack adds something into it, right? So this is basically something related to the life cycle, but um, eventually you'll see that the build pack uh, already add, uh, contributes on some layers. So this is the class counter. This is basically the Java security properties. This is the GRE, so notice the size of it. So 140 is basically the entire GRE. Uh, then we have another layer which uh, contributes the JVM kill agent, as we have mentioned, another layer that will contribute the, the local DNS, another layer that will contribute the memory calculator, and so on and so forth, until the uh, last layers, which basically uh, use the layer jar that we have seen to split our code, our code into different layers. So notice this layer, it's 18 max, and uh, it, it basically contains the libraries of our application. Then we have another um, another um, layer which basically has the boot uh, loader. We have another layer which has our container, uh, our coat. Right? So basically we have everything layered in its own uh, layer as we have seen in the jar file, which is really nice. Right? So at the end of the day, we'll end up having a container with high standards. We have a container which has like multiple layers for our application, but also contributes or has a bunch of uh, things that will make our uh, container uh, up and ready right, for uh, native uh, or cloud native deployment, which is really, really nice. All right, so far, so good. Right, so now we have our container, now that we, we know how to build a container, different ways to build a container. Of course, um, Jeep and uh, build packs are doing a great uh, job building those containers, but uh, sometimes we need to go back to Docker files. So Docker files are really, really flexible, right? So if sometimes you might need more flexibility and Docker files are also an option. So uh, build packs, are not a replacement of Docker files sometimes. Right? So it's really nice ways to get the container uh, done or created. But sometimes if you need more power, you can go back to the Docker files, but you'll have to take care of everything that we have mentioned before. Great, so now you have the container, right? So you're ready to um, distribute that container. So hopefully you have uh, pushed the, the container to a registry and now we can run this container somewhere. You could use um, uh, Docker Run, right? Uh, so that you could run your container, right? So just uh, lo locally, we could do that. Um, but probably in production, 
you will need some kind of orchestration, right? So you will need to observe your containers, to check whether they're available, whether um, you, you want to scale those containers, the application, uh, you want to have some operability and maintainability and many other things. Right? So just running your container, maybe with Docker Compose or any other tool, won't be enough. Right, so when you go to production, maybe you need some kind of a, a container orchestrator, and this could be Kubernetes in our case. Right, so, well, the premises of Kubernetes are really nice. So you get a platform where you deploy the application. Uh, it's going to be constantly monitored, and uh, the, the platform will uh, restart the, the, the pods or the containers that are uh, not alive and so on. But when you get into Kubernetes, well, someone will tell you that Kubernetes is, uh, is great, but of course it has a, a learning curve, right? So, well, I, you basically see a lot of articles on, on the internet telling you that Kubernetes is, is great, uh, it's easy to get started, and then when you get into Kubernetes, you will see that, well, you have to understand a lot of things like what a config map is, what a deployment is, what a service is, what are the, uh, uh, what is airbag or the persistent volumes or many other things. But it has a learning curve as well. So I'm not going to try to um, tell you what Kubernetes is, but at least I'll tell you a little bit about the, the bits and bytes that we'll need to push our application into Kubernetes. So, so far we have what we see here. We have a container where we have our application, probably we have layered our application and we have pushed our container into a container registry. As mentioned, this could be Docker Hub or any other container registry which is out there. But in Kubernetes, we cannot simply deploy a container. So the um, smallest, smallest unit of deployment is a pod. A pod will contain your, um, your application, your container. Actually, in a pod, we can run multiple containers, right? but usually we have a one-to-one -one mapping between your application and a pod. Right. So again, you can have multiple containers, but this is going to be the deployment unit and the scaling unit as well. So if you want to scale, you'll be scaling a pod, an entire pod. That's why, well, having things like um, a database inside the same pod as your application might not be a good idea. Right? Because when you scale your application, you'll be scaling the uh, database as well. That's so usually have this one-to-one -one mapping into uh, the pod. But this container, right, or this pod needs to be replicated. At the end of the day, uh, having single, a single instance of the application won't be enough in production. So we'll be creating a replica set, and the replica set allows us to define the replication of the application. You can decide, well, I need three instances of the application, so the replication will be three in our case. And this will take care of our uh, containers, our, our pods. It will basically check that the uh, uh, current state is the same as the desired state. If we mention that we want three, three instances of the application and there are only two, Kubernetes or the platform will automatically create an extra pod for you, an extra instance of the application for you. So it will make sure that you always have the number of replicas that you need. But rarely uh, you'll be creating a replica set by its own right, or a pod by its own. So you, you never create a pod by its own and it's, it's rare you can do it. Right? But usually what we create is a deployment. And when we talk about pods or replica sets or deployments in Kubernetes, that translates into a YAML file, right? So we have to go back to writing uh, some files. So in, in Docker, we have avoided, avoided writing these Docker files, right? By using G for uh, build packs. But now we have to go back to YAML and create the pod definition or the repl uh, replica set definition or a deployment definition. So usually we'll be creating a deployment definition that will define the number of replicas of your pod and it will uh, define also the containers in those pods. So the base, uh, the, the images in the registry and so on. Great, but now when we have the pods uh, up and running, those pods uh, are not going to be visible outside. So they are going to be local in, inside the cluster. But if you want to make them visible to the outside, you need to define a service. We have different types of services, right? If you deploy that into a, a Kubernetes uh, a provider like a GKE, right? This could be a load balancer. Or in, um, locally, this could be simply uh, an exposure of, or basically defining an IP that will expose those pods. So service is nothing more than a way to access your, your pods because by default, they will, will be internal and you won't be able to access them. So we need to create a service to interact with uh, those pods. Great. So 
In Spring Boot uh, 2003, we have something called the uh, liveness, or actually the concept, or also in Kubernetes, we have uh, the concept of, of uh, liveness. And what is, uh, or when do we call that um, a pod is alive, right? So basically when the internal state of that pod of the application is valid, right? So we basically started the application, everything is valid, and we can basically say that the application is up and running, right? So when the uh, aliveness uh, test or prop uh, says, well, we are not alive, so something wrong is in the, uh, in, in the application, what Kubernetes will try to do is to restart the container. So the liveness test or uh, the, the, the probe basically says, well, can we restart the container and get a cont uh, an application live and in a valid state? And so basically it answers this question. If restarting the pod or the container will solve the problem, then just say, well, I'm not alive, right? And in this uh, liveness probe or actually check, uh, you usually don't interact with external resources, right? Because let's imagine that you um, have a health check against a database and you make this part of your liveness check. What will happen is that if your application is up and running and your database is down, Kubernetes will try to restart your container. But this can uh, deal to cascading failures because if you have more than one instance of your application, it will, this will start restarting all the pods, all the containers that you have just because your database is down. So usually that's something that we check without external systems. And in Spring Boot to the three, we have an endpoint right, uh, to check for the liveness of the application. So back in the days when we didn't have a Spring Boot to the, to the three, we usually set the liveness uh, probe to slash actuator slash info. But now we have right, uh, a specific endpoint for that called actuator health liveness. We have another concept, uh, which is the readiness. So you could be up and running, but maybe you're not ready to accept traffic. So let's imagine that your application is up and running, but you are building the cache, maybe from, from another resource. So while you're building the cache, your application is not ready to accept traffic. So when you're not ready to accept traffic, your application will be removed from the services. So no traffic will be routed to your applications. Right. So you have to be real careful on uh, what you define here in the readiness uh, um, check right, or probe. Uh, we have some recommendations, but uh, at the end of the day, it's basically you that you define what uh, makes your application ready. Right? But at the end of the day, um, this needs to be something that yeah, you define. Right? And we'll see that in a second. So in Spring Boot 3, uh, as we have uh, the concept of liveness and readiness inside the application, um, we have a couple of uh, components that will be part of your application context that you can use to uh, change the liveness and the readiness state. Um, we have a couple of objects called readiness state and, uh, and liveness state. And by injecting or getting an instance of the application availability, right, uh, which is already in your application uh, context, you'll be able to check uh, the liveness state and the readiness state. If you want to change uh, the liveness state and the readiness state inside your application, what you can do is to emit an event. At the end of the day, um, when something happens in your application, let's say, well, I'm uh, building the cache, you only know when the cache is ready or uh, yeah, when we have ended building this cache. So at this point, you can send an application event and change the state of the application from unready to uh, ready. And you can do that with this availability, availability change event. So let's take a look at it uh, in a second. So if I have here a cluster. Let me just uh, log into the cluster with uh, this token. I have here my uh, local cluster, right, uh, which uh, doesn't have much. We see here that we don't have any deployments, we don't have any pods, we don't have any replica sets. And uh, what we're gonna do now is to basically take the, um, the, um, the, the Docker container that we have created and push it into uh, Kubernetes. So for that, uh, what, we can, what we'll be uh, creating is basically a deployment. Let's go back to, to our um, terminal. And I'm going to create a, a folder called uh, 
uh, oops, well, Kubernetes, just forgot the S, but anyway. And uh, I'm going to check the registry first and let's see what we have uh, in there. Uh, let's see what we have here, curl, uh, catalog. All right, so we have a bunch of, um, of uh, containers. So I'm going to push one of these uh, containers directly into Kubernetes by creating what we call a deployment. A deployment is nothing more uh, than a YAML file, but as mentioned, we might not be willing to create a YAML file. So what we're gonna do is to use the uh, kubectl command or kubectl or kubectl, however you call it, to create a deployment right, uh, implicitly right, or interactively without having to create a YAML file. We can do it by using the kubectl create deployment. I'm going to specify the name of the deployment, Spring Boot SG, and the app image of the deployment, which I'm going to choose localhost 500 Spring Boot SG build pack. And notice how I'm using this minus O YAML. So that basically uh, generates the output YAML as a YAML file. And I'm going to use this dry run. Dry run simulates the creation of the deployment. It's not sending that into our Kubernetes cluster. It's basically simulating that we create that deployment. So that is what this will do is to generate the YAML file corresponding to a deployment. And I'm going to pipe it to deployment.yaml. Um, great. So hopefully we have the deployment uh, created. So let's take a look at the deployment.yaml. So that's basically my deployment. So we see the name of the deployment. We see uh, a label. We see the replicas as well. So by default, we get one replica of the application. And we see uh, the uh, container that we're going to push into uh, one of these pods. So now that we have the YAML file, what we can do is to kubectl apply minus F and uh, we pass the deployment.yaml. If we take a look at our um, cluster, let's uh, yeah, put it here, and we deploy that, we'll see that the pods will be created. So notice that uh, by deploying or applying the deployment, we have a deployment created, but also a pod created and a replica set created, right? So remember, right? so a pod is basically the smallest, the smallest unit of deployment, but we have to define how many replicas we want, and we also define the uh, deployment. So now we have one pod, and as we see here, well, this is basically uh, having our container. Uh, this is running our uh, application internally. And what we could do is to change the deployment. So I'm going to change the deployment and say, well, I need uh, more than one replica. I'll be, uh, or I want three replicas. I'm going to deploy that or apply that. Minus F, deployment.jaml. Let's uh, just move to, to here for a second. Uh, let's apply that and let's see what happens. So here we have one out of one, but notice that automatically this will create uh, two other pods, right? And it will basically start our application. Now we have three different pods um, containing our application, but these pods are internal. We cannot access them as mentioned before. Right? So we need to create a service uh, from it. Great. Um, Another thing we can do uh, just real quick um, is to try to kill one of these pods. Let's say I want to kill one of these pods and just because we have the replica set, we have to see this pod being recreated. So I'm going to delete this resource from here. I'm going to quickly move into the overview and uh, we'll see that, well, we have two out of three pods and these will automatically, will delete the pod uh, that from, from, um, from our cluster and then deploy the new one. Right, so yeah, so now we have the three of them up and running. So we have detected that one of them was deleted, but we needed three pods. So we have recreated a new pod. Okay. So now let's get into creating the service. So are we going to use the same uh, approach? We'll be creating the service um, implicitly without creating a YAML file. And we'll do kubectl create service. And uh, we have different types of services. We'll create a service of type uh, cluster IP that will create a, basically an IP right, uh, inside our cluster right, to basically interact with our, with our uh, pods. But this could be a load balancer if you run within a, a GKE or any other uh, platform. And we're going to, again, right, so generate the YAML and we'll do a dry run, so that means we're not going to send it to uh, the Kubernetes cluster. We'll basically simulate that and send it to a service called uh, a file called service.yaml. Uh, 
All right, so now we have our service and the service looks like this. So it's basically uh, uh, getting access to our pods. So we'll need to apply CTL minus uh, apply minus F service. We need to apply the service. Uh, let's take a look at the services real quick. And when we apply the service, we'll see the service uh, being created here. Uh, that's our created service. And notice how it basically has right, uh, the three pods accessible. So that means that if you use the IP of the service, you'll be able to access one of these pods or any of these pods. But as we are uh, locally, what uh, we need to do is to forward the ports from our host machine into the ports of our uh, service. And we're gonna do a port forwarding for that. Let's just let me open a new terminal. So we're going to do a port forwarding for that. So we're gonna do kubectl port forward, service spring boot, and we're going to uh, map uh, 8080 to the port 80. So hopefully, um, let me check. Too many windows here, tabs. Let me check the uh, name of the service. Um, service was called spring boot SG. So this needs too much the service. Okay, so hopefully uh, the port forward will uh, work now. And when we access here on our uh, machine localhost 8080, so this should actually uh, get into one of the pods. And so when we hit that, we are actually getting to one of the pods in our uh, Kubernetes uh, cluster. All right, so um, let's take a look at the liveness and the readiness uh, probes. In um, Spring Boot 3, as mentioned, we have two special endpoints that we can uh, configure to um, um, basically define what uh, is a, a live application and a ready application. So if you use this management.hell.probes.enable equals true, you will enable those couple of endpoints. If you deploy that into Kubernetes, these are already uh, enabled for you, but if not, uh, you can explicitly enable them by using this uh, property. Remember that we can change the readiness and the liveness by using something called the application uh, event publisher. So I have here a class, which is nothing more than a REST controller, which is exposing a port, uh, um, an endpoint called change readiness. So the only thing that this will do is to get the current, current state. So it will check the current readiness state. Notice that I'm going to use the application availability, which is already in the application context. I'm taking it, I'm checking the readiness state. And if this is equals to application um, accepting traffic, I'm going to change it to refusing, refusing traffic. And I'm going to publish this event. So by just publishing, publishing this event, we're going to change from a ready state to a non-ready state. And that will make our pod um, available, but it won't get new traffic into it, which is quite interesting. So what do we need to configure the, um, the uh, props, right? the readiness and the liveness props in uh, our um, Kubernetes cluster or uh, deployment? So we'll be, uh, let's see, if I will see it here. I'm gonna go to the deployment and I'm going to add a couple of properties. Right, which are the um, readiness and the liveness. That's here you go. So I'm going to set the readiness to actuator slash health slash readiness and the liveness to um, uh, actuator slash health slash liveness. I have changed my deployment. So I'm going to um, basically apply this deployment real quick. Give CTL, um, apply minus F deployment. And hopefully that uh, has changed my, changed my pods. Okay, so let's uh, wait a little bit. I have something wrong here. Right 
take some time. I'm not sure if I do it right because uh, that should be already up and running. But apparently, I did something wrong in my uh, deployment. Probably, it's probably something wrong in the identing of of this. Uh, check that. So, Michael, how are we doing with time? Um. I think it's okay, but there are like quite a few questions for you as well. Okay, so maybe you can uh, move on and um, leave some time for questions. Yeah, we can um, go back into the uh, chat. Uh, okay, yeah. um, just a couple of slides. Um, another thing that uh, Spring put uh, to the three introduces is the graceful uh, shutdown. Um, so at the end of the day. Um, if you have an uh, ongoing request and you say, I want to terminate the pod, you cannot leave those requests unprocessed, right? So you want to finish with those requests and then terminate your application. And this is called graceful shutdown. At that point, you don't want to accept new requests, but you want to wait until everything has finished, right? And uh, that's basically the graceful, graceful shutdown, which you can enable in Spring Boot the tree with server.shutdown graceful. And additionally, you can define how many seconds you want for a grace period. That works for all the server containers, both for uh, the server stack and the uh, reactive stack. So you'll see that when you terminate your pod, the pod won't be killed. You'll have the grace period to terminate or to uh, finish with the requests, and then your pod will terminate. Right? So that's really nice. So you don't have uh, ongoing requests right, uh, un unprocessed. And last thing I wanted to show you, but uh, we didn't have time to, to do it. Uh, at the end of the day, when you are de developing, uh, you, you basically go through this build, deploy, refactor kind of a cycle. You build your application, you have to, or actually you, you change your application, you build your container, you push it into a registry, and then you have to deploy it into Kubernetes, right? And this takes a lot, uh, some time and you have to uh, maybe uh, apply the, uh, or create the container, apply the, uh, the deployment again, and many other things. So what you could do uh, to, um, the faster well the, the, the point is to use a scaffold. The scaffold allows you to monitor your, uh, your, your source code. So when you change the source code, it, it will automatically uh, compile the source code, create the, the image for you, deploy it into uh, Kubernetes, and you can see the application up and running into your Kubernetes cluster. So this will simplify uh, a lot, right? Your development uh, for sure. But you can also use a scaffold for uh, your production environment, not only for, um, for uh, development. So, if you have liked what you have seen today, right, I recommend you to check out these couple of workshops. Right? So a really good workshop uh, from Ryan um, uh, Baxter and Dave Sire on Spring and Kubernetes. Uh, this contains uh, a bunch of the things that we have seen today. Right? So how to create the applications with the build pack, the containers with build packs, how to deploy that into Kubernetes, the liveness uh, prop, the readiness prop, and all this stuff, the scaffold and uh, customize and many of the tools. Actually, the uh, Kubernetes, uh, uh, environment is, is huge, right? So we have a lot of stuff. So you'll see, it is actually a really nice uh, workshop to follow. And then we have another one for, by Dave Sire as well uh, called Kubernetes Intro, which is also exposing or telling you a little bit about uh, all, all these things, right? So they are really similar, but they, I would recommend you to follow uh, both of them. They are really detailed and uh, they are great to understand right? uh, how to deploy your applications into um, Kubernetes. And with that, I think that uh, that's everything from uh, my site. Um, so we can just move into the questions. Yes, okay. So yeah, we have three questions. Nida, Nilesh, and Inu. Okay. Yes. And uh, the first one where, from Nida, we are all around your slide with uh, live, liveness, I think. So it's what okay. about uh, Spring Cloud Kubernetes and uh, what does bring what does it bring to into the game? Mm -hmm. I think it was around your... Yes. Yeah, so we haven't talked about uh, Spring Cloud Kubernetes. Um, that, that's uh, everything that we have seen is uh, on Spring Boot, so without being, using Spring Cloud Kubernetes. Um, Spring Cloud Kubernetes will add uh, extra things like uh, being able to use uh, this config uh, maps uh, as properties of your application. This will allow you to integrate with uh, service discovery and many other uh, cloud projects. 
uh, but again, right, so we are not covering that uh, today, right, uh, but that's actually uh, another um, project in the portfolio worth uh, checking it, right, if, you're, if you want to integrate with uh, config maps and uh, use other parts or bits and pieces of uh, Spring Cloud as well, like uh, service discovery and, and many other things like uh, client side load balancing, like with Ribbon. Right? So all this uh, integration is part of a Spring Cloud uh, uh, Kubernetes. Thank you. Yeah. After you have a uh, two other questions, I think one. Um, mm -hmm. The second one is so what is the difference between liveliness and readiness probes for K8 uh, versus Spring Boot endpoints? Okay. So uh, in Spring Boot, uh, before Spring Boot 2.3, what we usually did is to define the liveness uh, probe as um, actuator slash info and the readiness probe to actuator slash health, right? And um, well, that was uh, okay, but uh, probably health will interact with a lot of external resources. And as uh, we now have something called the health groups, you can group uh, different health checks in a group and we can have more uh, customized health checks uh, for Kubernetes. And that's why Spring Boot 2.3 adds two endpoints called uh, health slash liveness and health slash readiness that you can customize. And at the end of the day, those are nothing more than a health check groups that you can define yourself. Uh, what does it readiness mean or ready mean for your application? You have to define, define or decide what ready means. So the main difference between liveness and readiness is that liveness means that your internal state is, uh, is okay. So how I see it is that you as a standalone process are okay, right? Is, you're okay, right? So that means that nothing wrong happens in your application, right? Um, let's imagine that you have a cache and uh, this cache is corrupted, right? And you cannot live with that corrupted cache. But if we recreate the container, we're going to uh, be able to get uh, an application which is okay, it is uh, up and running, right? So I would say that the liveness basically answers the question, if I restart your container, um, will we solve the problem? If you think about, a database, right? Um, if a database is down, restarting your container won't solve the problem. So that's not, not something that you might want to uh, put in the liveness check or a liveness pro. Whereas the readiness basically says, I am able to accept traffic. So probably when you start the application, you'll have to do some kind of initialization, maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, starting the cache or accessing a remote service. And at that point, you're not ready to accept uh, traffic. You have to wait. And when you have built a cache, now that's when you can start accepting uh, requests. Thanks, Andrew. I think we have quite a few questions, but we're running out of time. So uh, they are more like ops oriented. Like, right. how are you managing this? Can you see the question, by the way? Or? Yes, I can see a question. I'm seeing okay. that. Maybe um, you can just yeah, so uh, things about service mesh, right? So well, service mesh will build on top of uh, uh, Kubernetes, uh, things like Istio will give you some extra behaviors, uh, extra stuff on top of that. Uh, that's actually uh, another topic, I would say. Um, uh, can you define Prometheus KPIs for uh, readiness and um, liveness? Well, at the end of the day, you can put whatever you want in the readiness uh, uh, check. It's, it's up to you. It's uh, uh, basically a health check that you can compose. It's basically a group. So you have to decide uh, what you, you want to put in there. Right? But you have to be careful because sometimes when you have um, checks against uh, external resources, that might lead to cascading failure. So you have to basically decide what makes your application ready and you only know what this means. And if you take a look at the Spring Boot documentation, there are some recommendations in there, but you'll have to decide what you put in there. Right? So we cannot uh, decide for you and, and basically have a, uh, uh, the right answer uh, for that. Or is that, Sorry, is that uh, possible? I think we have to get the questions because we're going to run out of time. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> I mean, you guys can keep uh, chatting on, on the meetup page if you like. You know. Jerome, you wanted to take a group picture before leaving? Yes. Uh, if it's possible, uh, we can uh, stop sharing and go to Gary review. And for all the people who want, uh, you can just uh, turn on your camera and Mikael will do a. Uh,
a small print screen. So say just um, hello to Sergi, to thank him, um, and thank the organization. So. Yeah. Okay, if I say I need to go now, have a birthday, bye bye. Thank you. Give me someone's birthday. So, thank you all, and uh, hope you had a nice um, evening. And you will be able to see it soon on the recording. It will be on the meetup page. Thank you all. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you for joining. Thanks all for joining. Yeah. Thank you. Adeu, Sergi. <laughs> You. you know he can speak Catalan, right? Can he? <laughs> <laughs> it's really similar to Spanish, so I guess. But he can, for sure. Spanish and Spanish together, I can hear Catalan a little bit better. But it's better with, um, with alcohol. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess that uh, we can all speak any language with alcohol. <laughs> Unfortunately, my Mexican is coming back after. So. <laughs>